The new regulations proposed by the Food and Drug Administration, known as the FDA, are part of the 2011 Food Safety Modernization Act, which aims to make the agency more proactive at preventing outbreaks. FDA Commissioner Dr. Margaret Hamburg recently stated, Preventing problems before they cause the harm is not only common sense, it's a key to food safety in the 21st century. She added that one rule requires science-based standards for growing, harvesting, packing and holding produce on domestic and foreign farms. It addresses a variety of possible routes of food contamination, including the manure used as fertilizer, water sprayed on crops, animals in the fields, whether workers wash their hands and how packing houses process food. The other rule sets out guidelines for preventive controls for human food and would require companies to have plans for foodborne illnesses. Food companies would have to identify the controls that can work to reduce potential hazards, implement those controls on a continuing basis, document, keep records, and then make corrections when needed. Inspectors will be able to audit the program to enforce safety standards. Food safety advocates applauded the new rules. They see it as a very important step towards food safety standards that would prevent contamination, whether it is produced in a food factory or being produced on a farm. To discuss the issue further, I headed to CARP Resources to sit down with President Karen CARP. They work with government, business, and nonprofit organizations to plan, execute, and evaluate comprehensive food system strategies and work all along the food chain, from production to processing to distribution, and from procurement to policy. So I founded the company in 1990, so this is our 23rd year in business. Yes, I'm very proud of that. Um, and the, we're a food and agriculture consulting company with two divisions. Um, our Good Food is Good People division focuses on fee, um, food systems strategies. So that can be anything from quantifying the demand for local food to fixing or strategizing to create a food access initiative so that more low income people have access to fresh foods or quantifying the economic output of a regional food economy, things like that. We also work in the field of sustainability by working with corporations to get them started with regard to sustainability. So we do strategic plans for sustainability for corporations. We go inside and we educate buyers and other management level people about the key principles of sustainability and how they can get going. We're really good at the let's get you going. Um, we do something called strategic sourcing where which is related to food safety actually, where a company, usually a manufacturer, but sometimes a big buyer like, um, like a food distributor or a school district. We did a large project for New York City Schools a couple of years ago where we, they wanted to create a strategy around purchasing local foods, but they didn't know how to approach it and they have all of these restrictions on how they purchase food. And we kind of go in and we peel back all the layers of different organizations' supply chain, and we sort of lay it out on tables, like taking a puzzle apart. We lay it out on tables, say these are all the components, these are your ingredients, these are the people, these are the trucks, these are the, the seeds and the species of the things that, that are being grown. What would you like to change? How would you like to make it better? And then we go back and we rebuild that supply chain with the values or the ideas that they have to make their foods better. Raised near the farms of Long Island after studying art in college, Karen found herself pulled back to agriculture and into the food industry. She began her career in food as general manager for a highly innovative restaurant group in New York City. In her move from art to agriculture, Karen emerged as an influential voice for New York City's good food movement. I continue our discussion by asking her about the challenges lower income families face in access to safer, better food. 20 years ago, there was no expression food access. It was hunger. That was the problem people were trying to solve. And as a former restaurant manager, I got very interested in hunger because of that dichotomy between managing a restaurant where people were eating great meals and then going home at night on the subway and seeing people beg for money. And this was in the 80s, in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, here in New York. Um, what we're extraordinarily interested in with regard to food access is using economic levers to create new strategies, to enable new strategies to flourish, to, to really prove that food access is an economic issue rather than a behavioral issue or an education issue. It is all of those things too, but essentially the main thing that keeps people from eating a healthy diet is money. And if people don't have jobs 
or good jobs, they don't have enough money to access food. Then when they're in a, a long-term pattern of not having enough money to purchase good or healthy or whatever food they want, they then, the, the education and behavior deteriorates around what people, what we should be eating, and then that gets passed down to generations. So uh, we're really in our, in our fourth decade. I am in my fourth decade as a professional working in this area, and it's not getting any better. In, in a lot of ways, it's not getting any better um, because the food insecurity problem in this country has just gotten worse. In regards to the Food Safety Modernization Act, Karen is optimistic but also says we shouldn't have waited seven decades to implement it. While it's the most sweeping changes to the nation's food protection system, it is also the only one since Theodore Roosevelt held office. I'm very happy that the FDA is getting more interested and possibly more aggressive about food safety because as, you, as we see, we have a lot of food safety issues. Um, I think what's happening is they've gone from zero to 70, right? They've skipped over seven decades. So they're going from, oh, we had this thing, you know, 70 years ago, and now we need to really make it, and getting people, getting the suppliers all along the chain up to speed on seven decades of slowness or neglect is really a lot to ask for the system. Why has it taken so long for these policies to be implemented? Because we've had a culture in this country, this also relates to the food access question, we have a culture in this country, have had a culture in this country where we feel that business would take care of all of our problems. One of the main challenges the FDA faces is that it doesn't have sufficient resources and finances to enforce these new rules. When asked about it, they said it's difficult to answer in terms of overall cost and initial costs to implement. I think because the government does not have enough money to not only create this program, um, kind of uh, a prolific program, a comprehensive program, they definitely don't have enough money to, to regulate it or to monitor it, that they must enter into partnerships with businesses, farmers, and with consumer interest groups, nonprofits. They must enter a partnership where all three of those or four of those stakeholders can work together. They all have the same end goal. Nobody wants people to get sick. Farmers don't want people to get sick. Food manufacturers don't want people to get sick. And consumer advocate groups definitely don't want people to get sick. So. I would love to see the sort of lack of resources at the government level be an opportunity for collaboration. That's the way I like to see things. So if there, something that doesn't exist creates an opportunity for something else. The new rules could cost large farms $30,000 a year. The agency did not break down the cost for individual processing plants, but said the rules could cost manufacturers up to $475 million annually. The agriculture sector is $188.4 billion dollar agriculture just alone that it does not include the food manufacturers or the restaurants etc so if we're talking about 475 million on an economy that if you take agriculture plus what the value that's added to it adds probably another it's about a trillion dollars let's say it's a trillion or two trillion dollar business food and agriculture probably four trillion out of our 15 trillion 15.7 trillion dollar economy 475 million sounds like a lot of money to you and me, but it is not a lot of money to ensure that the 188.4 billion dollar ag sector is safe. It's nothing. It's a, it's 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 a blip on a ledger sheet, right? It wouldn't even show up as a percentage on anybody's books. However, there is a small group that these laws will affect in terms of food production and costs local farms and farmers who don't have a strong lobbying group in Washington and who make up about 1% of the food economy. Smaller farmers, smaller food manufacturers, particularly those that are doing what's called direct marketing, so selling at farmers markets, selling into directly into schools and retail, op, retail stores and institutions, etc. The, 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 all the folks that are involved in the sort of local or regional food system, these producers, and I'm talking about farmers and manufacturers and processors and choppers and distributors, these people are disproportionately, for the, for the revenue that they generate, for the size of their enterprises, they are disproportionately probably going to be impacted by these food safety rules. Who looks out for these people, right? It's a tiny sector of the economy. It's maybe 1% of our food economy is the local food economy. It's growing really fast, but it's, you know, it's still really small. 
because of the demand for local food, we have all the schools and institutions in the, you know, everywhere in the country. We work all around the country, but this, the institutions have very strict rules because they are reimbursed by the USDA of the kind of food that they can purchase. So they have specifications that require certain level of packaging or certain level of what's called cold chain compliance. You pick the lettuce out of the field, you want it to be in a cooler within a certain number of minutes. Those things, all farmers really want to be able to do that, to get to have access to this market, but they need to have an investment. So it, the food safety regulations are another, another component illustrating the need for smaller, medium-sized farmers and food producers to have access to capital. Even though U.S. public health officials are advocating for their government to put in place better nutrition policies, these efforts have met stiff resistance. This is mainly due to the fact that the $1 trillion U.S. food and beverage industry is fighting regulations with a powerful weapon, its deep pockets. Research on the prevalence of obesity shows that after decades of remaining at the same level, it began to increase sharply in the early 1980s. The public sense of personal responsibility did not change then. What did change was the food environment, transformed by food industry imperatives to increase sales, to one that increasingly urged people to eat more by making it socially acceptable to eat anywhere, anytime, and in very large amounts. In this kind of food environment, all but the most mindful eaters overate. And so currently, more than 65% of Americans are overweight or obese. Nearly one-third of American children and adolescents are labeled as overweight or obese, and they are expected to be the first generation who won't live as long as their parents due to high cholesterol, diabetes, and other metabolic diseases. The public, for the most part, is divided on the issue. We live in a culture where everybody is so used to overdoing everything. You know, people go to a restaurant and they'll get three servings, but it's also not their fault because the media portrays a serving. You know, you look at a picture of the food that you're going to get and they say that that's, that's what you're going to get as though that's one serving, but when you really look at, at how much a serving is and, and how it's broken down, you're really having three servings. And it's not necessarily your fault. You thought that that was a normal meal, but it's not. Well, I blame consumers because, you know, no one's forcing them to eat the food that's being you know, served to them, you have your choices. So you can't, play, you can't blame the uh, restaurants and, and food industries for selling. You don't have to buy it. So it's really your fault. There's other options. And uh, there's really no one to blame but yourself in reality. I headed to Park Avenue Nutrition, known as an approachable, community-friendly, street-level center for everyone, to meet with nutritionist Lisa Cohn. I wanted to learn more about anti-obesity initiatives in recent years and why promoting nutritional education has been so scarce. Food laws, number one, are important because they do set standards and they do attempt to address certain issues. So sometimes issues do go unnoticed unless they're more formally acknowledged. And whether legislation is something that will be carried out by the people or enforced by those who set the policy is to be determined. But in general, I feel that if we make certain awareness that at least the public is on guard. And in general, what goes with the public behavior is with the food industry behavior. And in America, the food industry has a strong, strong amount of power. And the average person is not necessarily aware of that. So that power stems from the advertisement that even makes you firstly aware of that product in the marketplace, that has a presence in your neighborhood because there's a sign and they can afford to put up a sign, that gives you incentive to be invited into their environment, and also a very highly scientific process for creating a product that you're going to enjoy, not only taste-wise, because that's number one, the cost isn't necessarily the issue. If it tastes good and it makes your brain feel happy, you're going to go back for more. And there have been books published recently and continue to be published on this subject. And the reality is that most of us think that we have a free choice when we're choosing what we're eating. Yes, there is only one person who chooses what you eat. You pick up the fork and you feed yourself. You buy the soda and drink through the straw. However, if the marketplace has a limited amount of options that are not healthy for you, high in sugar, high in fructose corn syrup, high in additives, processed oils, foods that are not healthy for you, but simultaneously make your brain feel good, you are going to go back for that food, and it's at a scientific level. People often forget 
that food is chemistry, how it tastes, how it feels in your mouth, how it makes your blood sugar feel, how it nourishes your body to have the fuel to do the work that your brain and your body want to do. Cohn notes that we often also forget the powerful political lobbying arm the food industry has. But the food industry has a very powerful political lobbying arm as well. The food industry in general really in this country unfortunately has set a lot of the tone for the growing of food. There's a, a growing movement and it comes and goes in terms of the organic standards and the natural food industry. It is growing. It is a significantly growing sector of the population. But however, something like the beverage industry has just taken off like gangbusters. Some of it's healthy, for example, bringing in um, products that are of natural origin, say from coconut water from foreign countries and such, but a majority of the beverage industry really is sugar processed um, waters that really provide limited nutritional value and are significantly responsible for the increase in obesity with high sugar beverage intake. That power does come from political and monetary control. Mm -hmm. She adds that even if there is a demand for healthier food, it's not cost effective for many low-income families across America. And we've also created a food industry where it's actually less expensive to produce a piece of meat than to grow a piece of fruit. So we're in a situation where when the economy comes in and people on a budget, they're forgetting that a bag of beans which may cost a dollar and produce 10 meals, um, say along with a dozen eggs for maybe two fifty to three dollars a dozen, you're ending up with a piece of fried chicken and a soda and maybe some french fries. So the cost is really a big part as well, but the cost of production and our method of bringing food to marketplace is really turned around from a natural food-based, real fresh food, farm-grown, even animal-produced uh, food supply to a more hormone-induced, um, heavily synthesized um, artificial food source. Since Lisa gave me an introduction on the role high fructose corn syrup plays in obesity, I wondered if the government would finally see fit to engage in the sugar debate and take a hard look at the crops they're subsidizing. Or will Americans have to wait for this epidemic to reach its peak, much like the battle against cigarettes? Given the personal and economic costs of obesity currently estimated at $190 billion a year, it seems the government has many reasons to promote the health of its population. So I set up an appointment with Mimi Foss, professor and interim research director at the City University of New York School of Public Health at Hunter College. It's interesting that the industry is pushing back so hard that high fructose corn syrup is the same as, uh, as sugar. Uh, they don't really know that. The science is not out there to prove that. And in fact, preliminary evidence from Princeton University has been published shows that high fructose corn syrup is actually quite different. Uh, rats eating high fructose corn syrup with every all controlled conditions compared to rats eating sugar um, the rats eating high fructose corn syrup ballooned, became obese. There's something about the processing of the, of the fructose that is different in our bodies than from sugar. Uh, and industry is um, pushing high fructose corn syrup uh, products, and you'd be amazed they're in everything. They're even in yogurt. They're, it's, it's pervasive, uh, in part because we as a government uh, subsidize corn producers so that the syrup produced from the corn is actually below market price. So it's very cheap for them to produce and then sell very cheaply. So it's been uh, the actual obesity epidemic parallels the increase in high fructose corn syrup use in this country. Professor Foz's interest has always been in the connection between prevention and health and economic productivity. She tells me how they are all interrelated. Obese people are less likely to be hired and less likely to be promoted. And that's particularly true for women. And there's been studies that have shown that an obese woman is going to make $76 less per month than a non-obese woman in the same professions, uh, controlling for, for everything else. So in a sense, obesity is a hidden tax on, on those that are suffering from obesity.